live in a pretty trauma-soaked environment and we have to start moving to grow ourselves, to connect with other people, because in the process of connecting with other people, number one, we will actually develop a network and that's awesome, right? Um, but the second thing is that it actually really neurogenically helps us generate the complexity that we need in our brains to come up with complex solutions because solutions for, cl for climate change are not simple. We hear lots of, 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 of simple, you know, what, what we call dichotomous thinking things all the time. Like, oh, you know, don't drive your car. Don't fly on a plane. Don't eat meat. All these things. Well, they're part of a complex puzzle that we have to puzzle through and then look at where we want to work at the, on this problem so that we can all make a difference. And that's not easy. That means sometimes involve, involve, involves listening to people that we don't necessarily like. Um, but that is a process and an evolutionary ability that which we're going to talk about today that we all have to develop in order to come up with a solution. I feel like we exist in an off in, in an environment now where we're really quick to sort people into good or bad categories. And at some level that has to change, but I'm going to try to give some perspective on why that is the case. So I'm going to share my screen and get started here. Okay, so slideshow played from the start. So that's basically what I'm going to talk about in a nutshell. And there are a lot of ideas here that are, are, are really new um, that you won't typically encounter in a lot of academia. And there are reasons for that. Um, I have a blog. It's called empathy.guru. And I encourage you to go and look. Some of it's kind of tough. I'm a, my, my actual professional background is I'm one of the people that was involved in inventing this thing called chaos theory and nonlinear dynamics. I come from an aerospace background. I apply system science tools to a lot of the, the different things that, that it, I look now on the dynamics of social networks and how people work together in the context of understanding why we do what we do. And so of course, one of the big questions that, that's on everybody's mind is why humans aren't getting climate change and what we can do about it. And what I like to remind people is that there are reasons when people don't get something. I've been in front of the classroom now for 37 years. It's incumbent on the people who are trying to deliver the message to think about why that's true and come up with answers that may not necessarily be the most obvious answers. And that's what this talk is about. Okay, so we all know this picture. This is the bad picture, right? We see atmospheric CO2 at Mauna Loa. It's going up. And there, this, to me, this whole notion of is there climate change or is there not climate change, that's, that's a settled thing. We all know this. We all know that it's anthropogenic, meaning that it's coming from carbon, carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. Um, the reason Mauna Loa is interesting, it has some of the purest air on the planet. It's in Hawaii. It's up on top of a mountain. And so it's kind of like the gold standard as far as, as carbon going into the atmosphere or CO2 going into the, the atmosphere. We say carbon, but what we really mean is carbon dioxide. So hopefully everybody, everybody knows that, but if not, that word carbon that we use is really CO2, and it comes as a byproduct of burning mostly fossil fuels. It all stems from burning fossil fuels. So, all right, so that's the bad car, that's the bad thing. Everybody's might've seen that before. Um, that's, that's the curve. And of course, that curve has different consequences dependent on the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. But you've got to get people to understand those consequences. And those consequences are a combination of local and global things. And so then we have to start thinking about how does the human mind work about understanding things? And that's what I write about. So it's a long-term phenomena. And, and here's the key now for everybody out there Thank you for being here. Without practice and evolutions, humans think short-term, static, short-term. Okay, what am I gonna have for dinner? Static, and we're not judging. Okay, I, let's get away from that judging idea because this is a WSU community here. I'm, I've been, I'm, like I'm fond of saying, I'm an institution at this institution. So I'm not judging anybody. You are all my people, okay? But let's, and let's try to not judge other people either, but let's understand it. Okay, so short-term, static, it's not changing over time. We come up with a belief like, 
you know, let's, I'm, if I drive my car, I'm contributing to global warming, so I'm never gonna drive my car. That's a static perspective, okay? Fragmented, we tend not to put pieces of information together. We tend to focus on one thing and then just assume that's the truth. And of course, there's all sorts of context involved in everything that humans do. And that's also true. But our natural tendency is to think fragmented. And then incoherent. We may have two or three different complex, we may have two or three different views that may be contradictory to each other. We don't work to resolve those. And we also don't work to talk to other people to resolve those. We just assume that they sit in our mind and they're okay because what we've always believed. And then the last one, which I find is really, really true in academia, is we are unaware of our ability to change the system. We are very, very capable of making powerful change. You know, one of my favorite, um, whatever you want to call it, folk singers, prophets, is an old hobo called U Utah Phillips. And, and, and he had the statement, which I think is really true. We are armed to the teeth with the weapons of privilege. We are educated people. We can write, we can communicate, we can think. We are very, very lucky that we are where we are. Okay, now I'm gonna start telling you how people think. And what you'll find is that when you start telling people how they think, they get very, very angry quickly. So, and the reason is for most people, when you tell people how they think, they think they think the way they think. And then you start figuring out the way they think. And to them, when you tell them, it's actually what we call a boundary violation. You know, it's like they feel an intruded, they feel you are intruding on their sense of self. So I want you to try to suspend that. I mean, I'm, we're anonymous basically here anyway, and I'm gonna kind of help you understand how people think. Okay, and, and that, I hope you'll reflect on that and think about how you think. Otherwise, there's just no point in doing this, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how awareness grows, and we're gonna reframe this in terms actually of like kind of basically engineering characteristics, time, space, energetics, and complexity. So climate change, like what are you gonna do if you think about it, oh, well, I don't have to worry about it because it's a long time away, that tells you something about the time scales you're thinking about or space, well, you know, I recycle my garbage, so I don't need to worry about climate change, okay? Then you're telling me that you're really interested in a very small amount of space around yourself. Energetics is the same way. And then complexity. We don't deal with complexity very well. We, we basically think, okay, well, we're just gonna have a simple solution. You know, we're gonna eliminate the, air, the airline industry. Okay, well, it's actually, aircraft are a source of, of carbon pollution that you need to worry about, but, Complexity involves that you understand kind of how this whole thing works and what the trade-offs are. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna put up a plot here that basically shows a developmental map that's tied to what's called spiral dynamics. And you can look this up to understand how we, we change in complexity. So we start out as a baby, we're born, and then we discover Santa Claus, we're up to tribal magical. Um, you know, if you ask a five-year-old about how Santa delivers presents to everybody on the planet, they'll say reindeer. And if you don't, if you disagree with them, they're like, what part of reindeer are you having a hard time with? Up to authoritarian, they need somebody to tell them what to do. And then there's an understanding of needs for rules. And what I find with most, and I'm, um, you know, I know there's a mixed audience here, but I address the college students. You guys, I work a lot on getting you to transition from need understanding the need for rules because you actually tend to be very obedient, okay? But you have to learn how to flex things to achieve your goals. And that's actually a developmental stage that involves you growing this inside yourself. And then for the folks that are, it's, it's not that, that there isn't any green in, in younger people, communitarian, um, the need to get back, but you, that really comes on strong, believe it or not, around 35. And then, that self-reflection, which we all need to do. We all need to do this. This is not just, this is not just, but it, it's way easier when you get older. And then you figure out to, the place in the world to make a difference. And there's this thing about relationships. In order to have relationships, the relationships above this line we call the trust boundary are basically formed through you thinking and listening to other people and then the relations before. It's like, I'm a professor that are below it. It's like, you know, I'm a professor. I'm an authority, whether you like it or not. You get mad at me, that's too bad. I'm still a professor. But if you listen to me and actually take what I say and use the data, that is 
could be performance-based and that's above the trust boundary. It's how we form relationships. So let's keep going because I know we're almost running out of time here. And then the society moves the same way too. And this is a very, very difficult thing to discuss in academia now because we basically assume that everything's flat, but everything isn't flat. Now that doesn't mean that every party here and different societies don't have wisdom because they do, absolutely they do. But we need to understand a little bit on how this rolls in order to understand the policies that we're gonna be able to create. And we've seen a lot of this with the COVID where some stuff works and stuff doesn't. Once again, this is the subject of like a multi-hour lecture. So I'm gonna tell you the different societies, societies also evolve and we need to continue to think about evolving our society. Okay, so similar kind of principles, how we form relationships in society. Do you listen to me because I'm an expert? This is a big one right here right now. Or hopefully you listen to what my argument is. And if my argument makes sense, then you believe me. I want the second. I want you to listen to the argument. I don't just want you to listen because Dr. Chuck says something. Okay, and believe it or not, it's all how we practice relationships because how we practice relationships is what we do with the majority of our time. Now, here's the problem. In academia, we don't look at relationships. We don't look at what we call empathy, which is how our brains connect, okay? We don't really, we study, we might study a single phenomenon, but we live in these social structures where my title, I got a long title, trust me, is more important than what I say. So we have to evolve that in order to start you know, to make progress in how this works up here by listening to people because as we relate, so we think. And that is going to be the thing that drives us to be able to come up with those solutions. It's listening to everybody, connecting with everybody, appreciating the contributions and the relative contributions that come and making this thing work better so we can synthesize solutions. Okay, and then how do we change, involve, you know, here we go. I mean, this is like, this is like a crash course in Dr. Chuck's theory of everything, but how we relate is how we think. And so what I want to leave you with is how, how do we change and evolve our own mindset? And so here, here's a really important thing. You know, let's go out and let's meet different people. Think about it as, of course, listening to what they say, because that matters, but also listening to other people makes you problem solve across different ways of thinking. It exercises this thing up here. Okay, the next thing is realize that the media debate happens on what I call intellectual flatland, black and white thinking, you know, and, and the videos before are pretty good, but there was a lot of black and white. Either we're gonna die and it's all gonna burn or we're gonna save the world, black and white. Okay, now the reality is, is that we don't know what the reality is. But we know we have a problem and we know that if we can embrace that uncertainty, listen to people and then synthesize, our odds of fixing this problem go way up. Okay, attempt to synergize your thoughts with others. Move past agree and disagree. See past action. Don't become paralyzed. The fear factor that's been present in our society in the last year is terrible. I mean, and you, you get dosed with it but you have to see through the, the cloud. You know, I call it flying IFR, instrument flight rules. See through to find the right way to go. There is nothing like connecting more broadly and geographically to in your relationships. If you have friends in China and there's plenty of opportunities on the WSU campus to, to develop friendships across our international student body, then you'll start paying attention to what happens in China and your scope, your scale of thoughts will start evolving, okay? Learn history. I think history is, you know, I'm an engineering professor and I think history is one of the most important things that we can learn. And then finally, know yourself. Everybody has a perspective. You have a perspective. I have a perspective. So learn how you think yourself because then when you listen to something, you'll start processing, hmm, do I need to accept what I'm hearing? Do I need to synthesize with it? Do I need to reject? You know, you will develop that agency as you go through. And this directly applies to finding things that you can do to help with the climate change problem. And then finally, social media, okay? I mean, you know, we're hearing all sorts of stuff about social media, you know, about how terrible it is, Facebook, blah, 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 blah. Take all that with a grain of salt while at the same time, 
working to understand. Remember, we're trying to move to that shades of gray, that evolved perspective, because social media gives us the ability to connect with people across the world. If you don't have social media right now, I mean, if you don't use it correctly, like here we are doing this Zoom thing, I happen to be in Reno right now, we would not be able to connect. This is a powerful tool for working with global, with, 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 with working on global warming. The pros, geographic reach, you can talk to people around the world, sensing you can get opinions and do seek out opinions. You know, there's a whole sunrise movement in the United States. There's the whole extinction revolution, um, rebellion thing that's going on in Europe right now. Find people around the world, get a diversity of opinion. There is no orthodoxy at this point. Once you accept that guiding principle of, of the fact that we have climate change, we have global warming, we have to figure out what to do about it. That's important. And then read, learn about the world's impacts, okay? And, and it's a great way to organize for collective action because you'll find people that have somewhat your same view and that you can apply some methodology or, or potential to make change because you are a powerful person. And when you deny the fact that you are a powerful person, you are basically shirking on your responsibility. Like Utah Phillips said, we are armed with the weapons of privilege because we have education, we get to eat. You know, we, we don't have many things to worry about that people around the world don't. Now look, it doesn't mean that there are no flaws um, with social media. Fragmented informational source, there's a lot of junk out there. I mean, you know, the whole QAnon thing, sometimes it's hard to check narratives. Face-to-face -face follow up is impossible. And of course there are surveillance issues. There are people that do watch. But I would encourage you to not give in to the fear and look past because you are young and you are powerful. I have made my whole career off, you know, basically I call myself some weird old vampire because I deal with young people all the time and, and you're, you're amazing people. Never let anybody tell you that young people are the problem. You are not the problem. You haven't had a chance to screw up the world. It's old people like me that have screwed up the world. So with that, I think that's 15 minutes, Patrick. So I'm gonna just shut up and turn it off, okay? That sounds great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pazeski. I really enjoyed your talk. And I really thought it was interesting how you're talking about empathy and how that plays such an important role in fighting climate change. We have to connect. That is the key. We must connect and we have to be conscious in our process of evolution and connecting. All right. Thank you.